If you have a, a Bible, I invite you to turn to the book of Acts, uh, where we will be continuing in our sermon series on uh, the Acts of the Risen Lord Jesus, looking at uh, Acts 7, verse 40, 54, uh, to Acts uh, 8, verse 3. Chapter 7, verse 54, to chapter 8, verse 3. Uh, if you remember from uh, last week, uh, Stephen was on trial uh, for opposing God and Moses and the law and the temple. Uh, and Stephen responds to these charges against him by preaching this sermon, uh, looking at the, the history of rebellion among God's people and uh, the mercy of God throughout all these different times of rebellion. Uh, and Stephen concludes his sermon in Acts chapter 7, verses 51 to 53, uh, by saying, You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. What a way to, to end a sermon, right? <laughs> uh, Stephen, Stephen doesn't conclude uh, by saying, you know, he, here is what I think. Uh, I, I could be wrong about this. You know, I, I don't want to make any definitive statements or anything like that. But uh, you, you could maybe be a little more responsive to God. You know, that's, that's just my opinion. Take it or leave it. Uh, no, no, Stephen doesn't say that. He, he doesn't attempt to be winsome. He doesn't, he doesn't give them his thoughts. He gives them the word of God. He gives them conviction. He gives them the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he will pay for his words with his life, as we are going to see. Uh, one pastor said this, uh, there are two difficult realities you must know and must accept if you are to live faithfully as Christians in a fallen world. First, you will have enemies. And second, you must love those enemies. Uh, in Luke chapter 21, verses 16 to 17, Jesus says, you will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and some of you they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. And in Luke chapter 6, verses 27 to 28, Jesus says, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. So, so we see it here, two difficult realities. We, we will have enemies and we must love those enemies. Em embracing either one of these realities is, is hard enough. Uh, the, the other night, Helena and I uh, watched the most recent episode of the show, The Chosen. Uh, if you are not familiar with The Chosen, it is a TV series about the life of Jesus Christ. Uh, and in the episode the other night, we were introduced to Simon the Zealot, uh, who was attempting to usher in the coming of the Messiah through violence against Israel's oppressors. Uh, but there was someone from the Roman secret police, his name is Atticus Emilius, uh, who was following Simon and who discovers that Simon is planning to assassinate a very important Roman official. Uh, Atticus is asked why he doesn't just arrest Simon before this happens. And he says that the zealots are martyrs with a persecution complex. Arrest him, and we'll only be adding fuel. Torture him, and he gets a seat closer to his God. Uh, there, there may be some who embrace the reality that they will have enemies, but who have no love for those enemies. Uh, they, they welcome opponents. They embrace 
persecution. They wear ridicule like a badge of honor and they will die on every hill. They exhibit a lot of courage, but no compassion. On the other hand, there may be some who love people, but who have no enemies. Uh, They want to be everyone's friend. They always avoid conflict. They don't want to offend people. They, They try to find common ground wherever they can. They exhibit a lot of compassion, but no courage. Uh, as parents, we know how dangerous this can be. Uh, if, if one of my kids is playing in the street, I'm not going to let them continue to play in the street because I don't want to offend them. Right? No, I'm, I'm going to remove them from the street because what my children need is someone who is going to correct them lovingly and courageously. And so we, we may be able to live out one or the other of these these realities in, in our own strength, in our own ability, but it takes nothing short of the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer to live out both of these two realities at once, that, that we will have enemies and that we are to love those enemies. And in our text this morning, we, we see that Stephen had enemies. Look, look at verse 54. Uh, we, we've already looked at Stephen's defense to the charges against him, but now, now we see how the crowd reacts to Stephen's defense. Uh, verse 54 says, Now when they heard these things, so when they heard his, his defense, and, and really when they heard uh, this, this stiff-necked people bit, uh, when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. I I don't think that I've ever had a reaction quite like that to one of my sermons. (laughs) Maybe, I don't don't know. But we see see here that they were enraged. Uh, The King James Version says that they were cut to the heart. Now, now we've seen before in the book of Acts of of, uh, individuals who were cut to the heart, right? Uh, In Acts chapter 2, verse 37, after Peter preached his sermon at Pentecost, uh, Luke says that when they heard this, when they they heard Peter's sermon, they were cut to the heart. And and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And so they, they had heard the same message, right? That they had rejected and killed Jesus, the holy and righteous one, but that God had raised Jesus from the dead and had exalted him to his right hand, making him both Lord and Christ. And they were cut to the heart. They were cut to the heart. But instead of being angry, they they wanted to know how they could be saved from the judgment to come. And and that's, that's what the word of God does in us. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says that the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Right? The, the word of God cuts to the heart. It, it, it pierces us and lays bare our soul. But instead of repenting of their sin, which is what we saw from the people in, in Acts chapter 2, Stephen's hearers had become so hardened and so stiff-necked and so resistant to the Holy Spirit that they respond in anger towards him. They they were indeed cut to the heart, but in the sense that their hearts were exploding with anger. And we've seen this behavior before from the Jewish leaders. In Acts chapter 5, verse 33, after the apostles accused them uh, of killing Jesus, whom God exalted to his right hand, right? Same message. We, we see the same message all throughout Acts. They were enraged and wanted to kill them. And the reason they don't is because Gamaliel stands up and, and, and defends them and says, if this is of God, then, then you're not going to be able to stop them. And so the question for us is, do we have enemies like that? 
Do we have enemies like that? And, and I don't mean enemies in a, in a generic sense because we can gain enemies for a number of different reasons. We can say and do things that will, that will bring a lot of enemies. I don't mean enemies like that. Do we have enemies because we lovingly and courageously speak the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Do we have those kinds of enemies? Are we willing to have enemies like that? Or would we rather want to avoid any kind of offense? Do we just want to be everyone's friend? Uh, we see that uh, we see that Stephen had enemies. The, these people hated him and wanted him dead. But we also see how Stephen was able to love his enemies. We not only see that he did love his enemies, we see how he loved them. First, Stephen was able to love his enemies because he knew God was glorious. He knew God was glorious. Look at verse 55. But he full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. You know, if, if I had a mob coming towards me, uh, ready to, to kill me, uh, I might be looking at them or I might be looking uh, around for a way to escape but look at where Stephen's gaze is. Stephen looked up to heaven. He looked up to his God. Uh, I was reading in my Bible reading plan earlier this week from Numbers chapter 21, where uh, the people of Israel grumbled against God and against Moses, saying, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. And so God sent fiery serpents among the people, which bit them so that many of the people of Israel died. And the people uh, went to Moses and said, we have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he takes away the serpents from us. Uh, and so Moses prayed on behalf of the people. And the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. And Moses does what God commanded. He, he makes a bronze serpent, he sets it on a pole, and if... Uh, a serpent had bitten anyone, all that that person needed to do was look up at the bronze serpent and they would live. And notice that Stephen doesn't, he doesn't look around at his situation. He, he doesn't look around at his accusers, you know, the fiery serpents that were seeking to end his life. He looks up. He looks to the only one who saves. And he sees the glory of God. One commentator writes, God peeled back the curtain for just a moment and allowed this man on trial for his life to see his glory. The teeth of the men that were being gnashed at him were not worthy to be compared with the blessed vision that Stephen enjoyed as he looked up into heaven. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, earlier in Acts 6.15, chapter 6, verse 15, uh, we saw that Stephen's face was like the face of an angel. Uh, there, there was something about what he, was, what he was seeing that was changing his physical appearance. But this is why he, Stephen could love his enemies. He could see what those around him could not. He could see what those around him could not. And, and so the, the question for us is, where is our gaze? What are we fixed on? Are our eyes looking around at the, the trials and temptations that we find ourselves in? Or are our eyes looking up to the only one who saves, to the only one who has the power to save us? Do, do we have eyes to see what other, people's, what other people do not? 
And do we, like the Apostle Paul in Romans 8, verse 18, consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us? Now, if, if we know God is glorious, then this should impact how we view our, in, our enemies. Or we, we should want even our enemies to, to see what we see and to know what we know and to experience the joy and peace and hope that we experience. Stephen was able to love his enemies because he knew God was glorious. Secondly, Stephen was able to love his enemies because he knew who Jesus was. Stephen knew who Jesus was. Notice that Luke writes that Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and remember, when, whenever that phrase is used, and it's, used quite, it's been used quite a few uh, times in the book of Acts, right? Whenever that phrase is used, it is in preparation for gospel proclamation. Prepara- preparation for gospel proclamation. Stephen is full of the Holy Spirit so that he could proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what that means. We, we saw this with Stephen back in Acts chapter 6, and we see the same thing happen here. Stephen looks up. He sees the glory of God, but he also sees Jesus. He sees his Lord and Savior. He, he sees the very one whom he is proclaiming to this, this stiff-necked people. He sees the source of his salvation. And he exclaims to his attackers in verse 56, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Now, if you remember, Uh, from when we went through the Gospel of Mark last year, uh, Jesus often used this phrase, the Son of Man, to refer to himself. Uh, This is the the only place, here here in Acts, this is the only place outside of the Gospels where this phrase, the Son of Man, is used. It was a divine title that comes from Daniel chapter 7, where Daniel has a vision of one like a Son of Man approaching the Ancient of Days, who is God. But then Daniel sees that the Son of Man was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him, indicating that the Son of Man was not just a man, but that the Son of Man was also deity, that the Son of Man was also one with God. And so Stephen is able to love his enemies and do good to those who hated him and bless those who cursed him and pray for those who abused him because he knew who Jesus was. He knew that Jesus was the Son of Man whose dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Stephen is saying, whatever may happen to me, whatever the consequences uh, of living in a fallen world, I see the Son of Man. I see my Savior and my Lord and my King. So you can can revile me. You can persecute me. You can utter all kinds of evil against me. But I know Jesus will one day right every wrong and there is nothing you can do to me that Jesus is not greater still. With with that kind of confidence in who Christ is, there is nothing that these people can do to Stephen. And there is nothing that anyone can do to us. But how often, how often do we know who Jesus is? How often do we know this about Jesus, and yet we we still want to vindicate ourselves when others revile us and persecute us and utter all kinds of evil against us? How how often do we want to right the wrongs done against us? You know, Romans 12, verse 19 says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And, And we go, 
Yes, and he will do it through me, <laughs> right? That's embracing the reality that we will have enemies, but that's not loving our enemies. Instead, we are invited to look to Jesus, who 1 Peter 2, verses 21 to 23 says, uh, committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. And so Stephen doesn't need to vindicate himself, and we don't need to vindicate ourselves because the God of justice will judge justly. He will not let sins go unpunished. They, they will either be punished in hell or, or they will be taken care of at the cross. But the Son of Man will right every wrong. And sin will not go unpunished. And we begin to see this already in the posture of Jesus. I mean, do you, do you notice that, that Stephen says that he sees the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God? The, the Apostles' Creed, if, if you know the Apostles' Creed at all, the Apostles' Creed states that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty from where he will come to judge the living and the dead. Uh, the writer of Hebrews describes Jesus' posture in heaven. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 12 to 13 says that when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. When, when Jesus ascended, he was enthroned at God's right hand. It was given all, all authority in heaven and on earth. Not in that poor, lowly stable with the oxen standing by. We shall see him but in heaven, set at God's right hand on high. But here, Stephen sees Jesus standing. This is the only reference in Scripture to Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Everywhere else, Jesus is sitting. Why? Why is Jesus standing here? I believe Jesus is standing to receive Stephen's testimony concerning Jesus. Jesus is, is rising from his throne to, to come to Stephen's defense and to vindicate him before his enemies. One commentator uh, gives the following illustration. In modern trials, uh, only two people <coughs> stand in the courtroom, the prosecutor and the defense attorney. The presiding judge sits on the bench and he remains seated throughout the trial. Imagine for a moment <coughs> that you are on trial for your life. You've come into the courtroom, made your plea of innocence, and sat down. And then comes the prosecutor's opening statement. He charges you with a heinous crime. <coughs> when he has finished with his opening statement, he asks the defense attorney to give his <coughs> opening statement. But as the prosecutor looks around, there is no defense counsel present. You'd be quite frightened at that moment. But then imagine that the judge leaves the bench, comes down to the floor, and says, I am the counsel for the defense. That's amazing. The, you see, the reality is that uh, each one of us has committed crimes of cosmic treason against the holy God. Uh, by nature, we are enemies with God. 
We have disobeyed God's law, desiring instead to go our own way and do our own thing. We can attempt to make our plea of innocence, but the evidence is stacked against us. <clears throat> Excuse me. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 12, Jesus says, Behold, I'm coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. God has appointed Jesus as both judge and defense attorney. If we are in Christ, if we have put our trust in the completed work of Christ on the cross, then we have Christ as our advocate before the Father. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We, we may stand before God's throne in judgment, but Jesus stands in our defense. And, and what a defense he is. Because if we are not in Christ, if we have not put our trust in the completed work of Christ on the cross, then we simply have Christ as our judge. And he will be entirely just to condemn us for our crimes against God. So another question for us is, who is Jesus to us? Who is Jesus to us? to us. Do do we know Jesus as judge or do we know Jesus as defense attorney? And do we want other people, even our enemies, to know Jesus the way we do? If we know who Jesus is, that he is the son of man who will one day right every wrong, that we should love our enemies enough to warn them of the judgment to come. This is what Stephen does. He had enemies, but, but he also loved those enemies even to his dying breath. Uh, we see that in these, these next verses. Look at verse 57. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. The, the irony here is that Stephen called them uncircumcised in heart and ears so that when Stephen tells them that he sees Jesus standing at God's right hand ready to receive him into heaven, they, they don't want to hear it. They don't have ears to hear. And so they, they grab Stephen and they drag him outside of the city to stone him. Uh, now commentators say that under Roman law, uh, the, the crowd was not allowed to execute uh, the death penalty. Uh, but they are so furious in this moment that the law doesn't matter to them. The, these people truly are those uh, who have received the law but do not keep it. And they lay down their, their garments at the feet of Saul and they begin to, to stone Stephen, killing him one stone at a time. And verse 59 says that as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Stephen echoes the words of Jesus in Luke 23, verse 46, where Jesus says from on the cross, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. But do you notice the difference in Stephen's prayer? Stephen is addressing Jesus. He acknowledges in his prayer that the Father and the Son are one and the same God. And so even in his death, Stephen is pointing his enemies to Jesus. I fear no foe, with thee at hand to bless. Ills have no weight, and tears no bitterness. Where is death's sting? Where grave thy victory? I triumph still if thou abide with me. Verse 60. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And again, Stephen's prayer echoes the words of Jesus from on the cross in Luke 23, verse 34. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And again, Stephen addresses his Lord and his Savior, Jesus Christ. 
He knows that judgment is coming for his enemies and their, their sin against him. But he also knows that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He, he wants salvation for his enemies. And so Stephen prays that Jesus will show his enemies the mercy they did not show him. Stephen dies with forgiveness on his lips. Do we have this kind of love for those who hate us? Do we want God to be merciful to our enemies? Or do we want them to get what they deserve? You know, when we when we consider that Jesus suffered and died, taking upon himself uh, the punishment we deserved, though he was entirely perfect and sinless himself, there, there, is no, there is no room for us to say that our enemies deserve punishment, that our enemies deserve condemnation and hell. Do, do you know what we deserved apart from the goodness and kindness of Christ our Savior? We deserve punishment and condemnation, and hell. But we don't get hell. We don't get condemnation. We don't get punishment because of Jesus. And so are, are we praying for Jesus to show mercy to our enemies that they too may experience the mercy of God? The Boxer Rebellion in China was the largest massacre of Protestant missionaries in history, with 188 adults and children being killed. 30,000 Chinese Christians also perished during the summer of 1900 at the hands of the boxers. Among them was Chang Shen, the best-known evangelist in Manchuria. Chang had been a notorious character prior to his conversion, a gambler, thief, and womanizer. At midlife, <coughs> he lost his eyesight, and neighbors considered it a judgment from God. Hearing of a missionary hospital in the distant area, Chang traveled hundreds of miles only to find all the beds full. The hospital chaplain kindly gave him his own bed, and over time, doctors partially restored Chang's vision. In the process, they introduced him to Jesus Christ. When Chang asked for baptism, missionary James Webster told him, go home and tell your neighbors you have changed. I'll visit you later. And if you, still, if you are still following Jesus, I will baptize you. When Webster arrived in Chang's village five months later, he found hundreds of inquirers. Chang's eyesight didn't last, but his evangelistic zeal did. He traveled from village to village, winning hundreds to Christ. Missionaries followed in his wake, baptizing and organizing churches of the converts he had won. <clears throat> when he was finally arrested by the boxers, he was put in an open cart and driven to a nearby graveyard while singing, Jesus loves me. At the cemetery, he was shoved into a kneeling position, and three times <clears throat> he uttered the words of Stephen, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he was killed with the sword. The boxers were so deeply shaken by Chang's quiet authority that they had his body drenched in oil and burned so as to prevent, they thought, his resurrection. <clears throat> but still apprehensive, they retreated from the area altogether, thus saving other Christians from death. The, uh, the early church father, Tertullian, wrote, Kill us, torture us, condemn us, Grind us to dust. The oftener we are mown down by you, the more in number we grow. 
the blood of Christians is seed. Stephen would be the first of many Christian martyrs. Uh, Verse 1 says that there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. But it's like this seed is being sown in the early church. As we are going to see in the coming weeks, how the gospel is going to go out to the Gentiles and how a young man named Saul, who approved of Stephen's execution and who was ravaging the church, entering house after house, dragging off men and women to prison, would eventually come to faith in the very Jesus he was persecuting. How does that happen? I said at the beginning that (coughs) it is nothing short of the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer to have enemies and to love those enemies. If everyone hates us, we may have a problem. If everyone loves us, we may have a problem. We can embrace either one of these realities on our own, but it takes the work of the Holy Spirit in us to embrace both of these realities. So the question for us is, are we prepared to speak the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and to lose our lives for it? In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, the Apostle Paul writes, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. If we are following Jesus, then we are following him to the cross. Are we prepared to faithfully follow Jesus and proclaim him even if it means our death? And then, will we love our enemies and do good to those who hate us and bless those who curse us and pray for those who abuse us? Will we consider the example of Christ who did not revile when he was reviled and who did not threaten when he suffered? Stephen shows us what it looks like to have enemies and to love those enemies. And, and we see how Stephen's example affected those around him. Just, just look at Saul. Stephen's prayer was for Jesus to show mercy to his enemies. And, and I almost wonder if Stephen was looking at Saul as he prayed because Stephen's prayer would be answered as Saul would eventually embrace Jesus Christ as Lord. By the work of the Holy Spirit, Paul, who hated his enemies, would eventually love his enemies. May God help us to embrace the reality that we will have enemies and to love those enemies. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, Again, we thank you for the example of Stephen who shows us what it looks like to embrace the reality that we will have enemies, but also what it looks like to love those enemies. God, we pray uh, that you would help us to live in such a way that we are able to win people over to the gospel by our conduct. Help us to know that you are glorious And help us to know who Jesus is. 
And may your word go out and take root and bear fruit for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.